Welcome to Explore the World, the International Education Office's virtual speaker series. I'm Jeanette Jasperson, Coordinator of International Education, and it's my pleasure to be today's moderator. Thanks so much for everybody who is attending so far, and those still coming in and those who will watch later. We were just talking um, among ourselves about how much we have enjoyed this series, what good presenters our faculty are, how older community members, our own relatives who uh, maybe are stuck at home for whatever reason, how this is such an enjoyable opportunity for them. We are recording this session, so for those of you who are live, if you want to do anything about that, just be aware. You know, the world is slowly opening back up. I saw just today that um, the U.S. is going to open its land border with both Canada and Mexico now to vaccinated travelers. So um, it is slowly starting to open happily, but there's a lot of us, including JCCC study abroad students who are not yet traveling. And so it's wonderful to be able to virtually travel with our faculty guides who have um, know these places and love these places. So this Falls Explore the World series is focusing on study abroad destinations for trips that we have ready to go. We're eager to take just as soon as the college gives us permission to go, which is going to be based on the Department of State's travel advisories, which unfortunately are a little bit more conservative than I wish they were. I mean, our government is trying to keep us safe. We do have to applaud that. But anyway, today we are gonna focus on Belize and Japan. And if you have any questions for the speakers, you can put them in chat at any time or afterwards we'll just talk like we have been um, just impromptu. So first up, you know, Belize is in alphabetical order first. And I wanna welcome uh, William McFarland, Bill, who's a professor of anthropology. Many of you know him. He has conducted archaeological research on pre-Columbian societies of Mesoamerica. He teaches a course, um, an anthropology course, with the word Mesoamerica in the title. Students, as you're looking at your spring course schedules, you might take a look for that. Today, he's going to virtually take us to Belize, a land of well-preserved Maya ruins, cultural diversity, and beautiful contemporary rainforests and beaches. Thanks so much, Bill, and the time is yours. How's that look? Everybody can see that? Yeah. Yes, Good. we can. Oh, excellent, excellent. Well, I thought, um, well, first of all, thank you, Jeanette. This is, this is a great opportunity to talk about uh, some of the trips that students could take, on, take at some point in the future, and I hope that they do. Um, what I'm going to try and do with uh, the, the time that I have right now is do a little bit of a travel log for a trip that um, hasn't happened yet. Um, this is kind of a, a 19th century tradition uh, going all the way back to O. Stevens and Catherwood. And hopefully this will have uh, significantly less colonialism in it. Uh, but this is a, a week long uh, trip to Belize. Uh, that would happen during spring break in 2023, 24, 25, whenever we're allowed to travel again. Uh, so I thought maybe we'd just sort of get oriented. Here we are, uh, virtually at least. I don't know where the rest of you are, but this is where the college is. And Belize is down there. Uh, and it's part of Central America. And it is sort of nestled uh, just south of the Yucatan, uh, the Mexican Yucatan just east of Guatemala and the Paten. Uh, and just north, there's a little strip there at the very bottom of uh, 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 Honduras that it's very close to. Uh, so that gives you a sense of, of where it is. And of course, the East Coast uh, goes right out into the, the Caribbean. And so it, it really is um, a, a hybrid of sort of Latin America, Central America, uh, Caribbean, and for a while it was a, a British colony, and so uh, it, it has this very diverse background. Uh, the, the first day of uh, the trip is largely a travel day, uh, and the point here is to get from Kansas City into Belize. Uh, we leave at an hour that is 
ungodly and um, <laughs> uh, torturous. Uh, but we arrive in Belize City by midday, and then we uh, travel from Belize City uh, into the Cayo District in the, the town of San Ignacio, which is basically on the border with Guatemala. And it's a, it's a pretty town. It's a very pretty region. Uh, here, it's not too mountainous. It's sort of this broad coastal um, uh, plateau. And the town of San Ignacio uh, has become kind of a hub for oh, uh, backpackers who are, are traveling into Guatemala or some of the sort of eco-tourists, archaeological tourists. Um, and it, it really does cater to uh, the traveler, the backpacker, that sort of thing. Uh, it also is a great representation of how diverse uh, Belize actually it is. Uh, the official, the government, uh, the official language of the government is English, uh, but you're just as likely, especially here in San Ignacio in the Cayo district, uh, to hear people speaking Spanish, or one of the many Maya languages, or um, Creole. There's a there's a Creole here, which is quite common, uh, or even uh, Garifuna. Uh, so there's a lot of different cultures and peoples and languages that that blend together here uh, in in Belize, and it really all comes together here in San Ignacio. And we would eventually uh, stay in San Ignacio for about four nights. Uh, it becomes kind of our our home base for most of the trip. Uh, day two, uh, we, we head south through the uh, uh, Pine Ridge Preserve uh, into the Maya Mountains uh, to visit the site of Caracol. And uh, Caracol is a classic Maya city. Uh, it's, it's quite isolated uh, from everywhere else, at least that's certainly how it feels today. Uh, but it would have been a major player uh, between, oh, let's say the current era, 500 all the way up to, to 900. Um, this, this would be on par with, with any other uh, great Maya city. And this is the, the largest building um, at Caracol. It's a, it's a building called Kana or uh, Sky Palace. And this is how it looked about 25 years ago. Um, and over the last 30 years, uh, research has been conducted at this site by uh, Arlen and Diane Chase, and they continue to work there. Uh, even now, they continue to work there. Um, what's great is their field season ends about the same time as our trip uh, would bring us there. And, and they said if they were there, they would invite us into the lab and, and uh, into the, the research center and, and show us what they're working on. Now, let's see, uh -oh. there we go. Uh, sort of here in the middle of this map where it says B19, that, that's Kana. Um, and you can see that it's really one of uh, hundreds of monumental buildings uh, at the heart of this city. And in the map on the right, you see these roadways that are leading out, those lines that are kind of creeping out, radiating out. Uh, from the center. Those are roadways through the mountains, uh, through the jungle, and they, they end up at these, what they call termini groups, which are these very large centers, uh, not quite as large as uh, sort of downtown Caracol, but, but quite large nonetheless. Uh, and one of the big goals that uh, the chases were working on in the, in the 90s uh, was to try and fill in the gaps here. You see this grid uh, and what they found, what they found was that um, uh, this is a, a very densely settled city uh, with with uh, thousand or more people uh, living in this this region. Um, it, it also is a place that has a lot of uh, a personal affection for me because it's the per the first place I ever did any archaeological research at all. Um, one of the the questions that they had when when I was working there is how they were feeding such a large population. And it's, it is fairly rugged terrain. Um, and as it turns out, there are uh, agricultural terraces throughout the whole city. Um, and so it really was a, a garden city uh, in that they, they lived amongst the fields. Um, and so along with a, a couple of other archeologists or archeology span students, I shouldn't say, 
uh, we, we kind of hacked our way uh, through the brush uh, and mapped all of these little terraces. Um, so it, it really is uh, quite a special place. Now today, this is what uh, uh, Kana looks like. It's been reconsolidated uh, and it has become a, a major stop on sort of the, the Ruta Maya. Uh, people are interested in seeing these great centers. And from the top, it is quite a spectacular view. Uh, this looks down into the, the plaza of the what they call the B group. Uh, and so this would have been a, a major ceremonial gathering space. And the elitist of the elite would have uh, been here at the top. Uh, very few people then would have been able to see it. But if you visit with us, it's, it's pretty easy to, to climb up those steps and take a, uh, take a peek. Uh, I'm going to try and, and see how this video looks. Just a view from the top of Kana looking down. And you can see there's a little private patio here that you would then descend down to a couple of terraces. But it gives you a sense of what the terrain would look like. Uh, and, and what the uh, the jungle environment around it would, would look like today. So that's a trip to, to Caracol. Uh, that would be day two. Day three, uh, we visit another major Maya center, Tikal, uh, perhaps a, a preeminent Maya city. Uh, Tikal is in Guatemala, and so it would be a we're crossing the border sort of day. We, we leave from San Ignacio, cross the border, head into Guatemala, come back across. Uh, so you get a, a bonus extra stamp in your passport if that's something that you're interested in, in getting. Um, Tikal is uh, just a beautiful uh, a park in the Paten. And here you see their great plaza. Uh, you know, there's some similarities with, with Caracol, but here uh, they really built up uh, in these, these tall uh, temples. You see on the right, Temple One. Uh, and then on the left image here, the, the North Acropolis. Uh, and this is where you know, anybody who is anybody of importance uh, in the dynasty of uh, to call rulership uh, would have been buried. Uh, let's see if the, the video here plays as well. So just a sense of the scale and kind of the grandeur looking down from Temple One across to the North Acropolis and the great plaza here. And then we'll eventually come over to, to Temple Two. Today, you, you can't climb up into uh, Temple One or Temple Two, uh, but you'll see in, in just a moment, there's a view from Temple Four that, that's very famous in pop culture uh, that you can climb up into that temple and look out onto the horizon. Uh, I'm, I'm throwing this picture in. It's a, it's a small building just to the south of the Great Plaza, that, that image that I just showed, but this is a very distinctive central Mexican uh, architectural style. Uh, there's a, there's a, a massive city in central Mexico called, called Teotihuacan uh, that played a role in sort of a, the, the founding of the, the long running dynasty at Tikal. And this is uh, perhaps one of the best examples in the Maya area of, of this particular type of architecture. And then here's that view that I was talking about. Uh, I, I was on top of Temple 4 looking across. Uh, in the far distance, you can see Temple 1 with the doorway open towards us. And Temple 2 has its back to us. And Temple 3 is, is over to the right. Uh, those of you who have watched Star Wars as many times as, as I have in A New Hope, this is a view that you actually see. Um, so it does have a, a place in pop culture. Um, so it was important uh, in the past, this was one of the great super states of the, the classic Maya era. Um, it's also important today in that uh, entire generations of archeologists uh, were trained at Tikal. I mean, you can see uh, even in those few pictures that I just showed how much work has been done here and a lot of the methodology that people used uh, continues to be um, uh, handed down from generation to generation. We can sort of trace our way back uh, to the Tikal project. Uh, day four, you have a little bit of a choose your own adventure. Um, one option, uh, and this is the one that I would do because I haven't had a chance to do this yet, uh, is uh, to take a tour 
of the Aktun Tunichil Muknal cave, or what everybody refers to as the ATM cave, although you have to pay to go in. Um, this is a, about an hour long hike uh, through, the, through the jungle. Uh, you ford a couple of rivers and you arrive at the mouth of the ATM cave. Uh, and then you get to go in and take a tour of the cave. Uh, and one of the exciting things you kind of get to swim into uh, the, the cave and there's a couple places where it's submerged in water and you swim through there. Um, if you can do this without thinking of the National Geographic theme, then you're a better person than me. <laughs> uh, this is uh, also uh, kind of a special, if you, if you understand Mesoamerican uh, cosmology, uh, they view the world as sort of three levels. There's this sort of celestial heavens of above. There's the, the world that we live in. Uh, and then there's this watery underworld uh, where you go when you die. And it's a, a place of great supernatural power. Uh, there's all kinds of uh, frightful deities who live down there. And so caves uh, had great significance in terms of this is an access into the, the watery underworld. Uh, and I'm not going to show them uh, in this format, in this setting, but there are burials uh, in here. And some of them uh, have become sort of crystallized. Uh, because of the sort of the geological processes uh, within the cave. Uh, and so it, it is a, a sacred space, a burial space, a ritual space, and you get to see uh, some of these, these contexts on this trip. Now, if, if you don't want to hike through the jungle, ford rivers, swim into a cave, um, the other option is to visit two sort of middle tier, middle size uh, Maya centers that are quite close to uh, uh, San Ignacio. Uh, these are Shunan Tunich and uh, Kahal Pech. Uh, Shunan Tunich is the image that you see here. The, the major building there is the Castillo. Uh, and this is a contemporary of Caracol, of Tikal, uh, though at a much smaller scale. Um, the Castillo, which you see here with the roof combs at the top, is the second largest. Uh, building in Belize, uh, and the, care, uh, the, the chases are always happy to, to mention that uh, Kana is the largest building in, in Belize, so that they win uh, in that, that respect. Uh, on the side of uh, the Castillo at Shunan Tunich, you get to see this uh, beautiful uh, frieze of uh, rain gods and, and, and moon deities. Uh, and so you can really kind of sink your teeth into some of the, the iconography here. Uh, and this is one of the best preserved uh, friezes that uh, you can find anywhere uh, in this region. And although uh, it is a preserve to protect the archaeological remains, it also protects a lot of the, the ecology um, here. Uh, in particular, uh, there is a troop of uh, howler monkeys that live here at Shunan Tunich. There's several troops at, at Caracol, uh, but here uh, there's one, and they're, they're pretty close, and we'll see if the video can sort of capture. If you can see them moving through the canopy, uh, not terribly gracefully, but um, that's, a, that's a troop of, of howler monkeys moving through. Uh, and this is one of the, the places where you can get up close and, well, fairly up close and personal with a, with a howler monkey. There's no audio of, of the howlers howling here, but it, if you do take the trip, it's, it's likely that you will hear uh, some of the howler monkeys. Now, Cajal Petch is, is right in uh, the town of San Ignacio. It's within walking distance of downtown, though it's a pretty steep hill to, to get up to the top. Um, a lot of the archeologists who work in this region uh, kind of talked down about Cajal Petch because of the way it was, uh, reconsolidated. They, they said that they were a little bit uh, heavy handed with uh, some of the interpretations. But uh, for me, it's one of the most beautiful sites uh, that we'll visit. Uh, it has an incredibly park like uh, and intimate setting with these sort of closed in sunken patios and uh, little walkways everywhere and little tunnels and stairs and hallways. It, it, I think it's really enchanting. Um, uh, but this would be kind of a, a possibility if you didn't go on the cave or if you had an afternoon that was free, uh, you could kind of quickly go up and, and check out Kahal Petch, which means place of the tick. So that may 
discourage some of you from <laughs> visiting. Um, day five is a, a travel day from uh, the Cayo district, eventually ending up uh, on one of the islands out in the Caribbean, Key Cocker, and along the way, uh, we stop at the Belize Zoo. And so the, the star on your left there is where the Belize Zoo is. It uh, is um, perhaps not uh, the biggest or most spectacular zoo that there is, uh, but it is important nonetheless because it, it becomes a sanctuary for a lot of the animals that have become habituated uh, to modern development. Um, that is uh, an increasing problem, especially for animals like the jaguar, uh, where ranches are kind of encroaching on their territory and they become sort of used to being around people in a way that's, that's, that's dangerous. Um, and so they have several jaguar here that have become habituated to people. They can't be um, returned to the wild in any way. Um, and so it is a way of, of protecting them. But then eventually, uh, you take a water ferry out to Key Cocker, um, and then the end of that rather long travel day, uh, we've, we've organized a sunset sailboat uh, cruise, um, which sounds just sort of lovely. Uh, one of the things I'm excited about with that is that it is at the end of the uh, it's in the middle of the rainy or the dry season. So there's no cloud cover. So on the way back in, you'll have a pretty clear view of uh, the, the, the stars. Um, and then you have a full day at uh, Key Cocker. Uh, this is our, our second to the last day. Um, so Key Cocker uh, is one of the sort of Caribbean island destinations, but it's not as built up as uh, some of the other bigger islands. Um, it is uh, absolutely one of the more Caribbean spaces that we will encounter though. And it is, it is quite attractive. Uh, it is a little bit touristy, uh, as you can see in, in this image on the upper left, uh, that's the, the split. There was a large storm that cut the island in half. The northern part of the island is now an eco-preserve and the southern part of the island is where uh, the hotels and shops and restaurants and everything are. Um, and then uh, it is a very laid back um, environment, a laid back town. Uh, that the dog is, is really exhibiting that, that sentiment. Uh, you'll see signs everywhere that say go slow, uh, which is kind of a, a way of a tongue in cheek way of saying like everybody relax uh, you're on the island, there's, there's nothing to do here but go slow. There's like three cars on the island, so to have a street sign that says go slow is, is kind of a joke. Um, but really, as, as lovely as the town is, uh, it's a jumping off point to go diving and to go snorkeling uh, and to have access to one of the most beautiful uh, parts of the Caribbean that there is. Uh, and we've scheduled uh, a snorkeling tour of the Belize Barrier Reef. And uh, there are three or four different stops along the way uh, where you can hop out of the boat and, and snorkel with a guide who points out um, all the different fish and the different types of coral and the different environments. And there's even like a, uh, uh, what do they call it? Uh, a seahorse nursery, a seahorse sanctuary. Uh, which sounds really exciting until you realize how small they are and you can barely see them. But no, nevertheless, you get to stop and see that. Uh, but this is really kind of the, the reward at the end of a, a long week is to be able to, to hop into the, the Caribbean and, and go snorkeling a little bit. Uh, and then the, the last day, we hop on the water ferry, come back into Belize City, and then hop on a plane and fly back to Kansas City. Uh, so it's, it's seven days uh, that you're away, six nights, I believe. Um, but I think we pack an awful lot in uh, to, uh, we pack an awful lot in to, to that particular trip. And that's, that's the trip. That's uh, basically what I did in 2018. Uh, there were a few other stops that I did. Uh, that I didn't include here. And there's a few things that I'd like to add in like the, the sailboat uh, sunset tour and the, the trip to the ATM cave. But for the most part, this is the trip that we have established. 
Um, if you participate, it would be scheduled during a spring break. I really recommend people, uh, if, if they're interested in sort of the, the prehistory of the region, uh, taking it in conjunction with my Mesoamerica course. And so the, sort of the first half of that course leading up to the spring break uh, is sort of preparing the students who are gonna go to Belize on some of the things they'll see. Um, but you can either do the Belize trip without taking the class, or you can certainly take the class without going to Belize. But I think if you do the two things uh, together, you, you really have uh, quite an experience. But that's uh, something I hope you would consider. Well, thanks so much. Yeah, Professor Hardy, and I've neglected to mention, and I'll do it now, that Professor, Prof, uh, Professor McFarland, I mean, I was thinking about Professor Hardy because he's the co-leader on that trip and he's with us too. So um, I wanted to mention that and certainly for students to take that course, even though we are have delayed this trip until spring break 2023, that's a good reason. You could still take the Mesoamerica course now. Uh, you could be all that time prepared, be saving some money and uh, man, howler monkeys, snorkeling, going into the cave of the underworld. Um, Bill, we had a question from Mary Hanover asking how tall those temples are. <laughs> you're, you're muted, Bill. Yeah. Um, they are, I think about 150, 200 feet, Kana is. Uh, if you go all the way up to the, the very top of B19, which is where I took the video from the very top of Kana, there's three little temples and there's one in the middle. That's about 250 feet, I believe, above the, the ground, the plaza surface. And then a lot of those plazas are built up as well. And have they been excavated inside or is it just the outside that's sort of? Um, they're not, it's not like open catacombs inside. They're, they're, they're largely solid, uh, but there are tombs um, inside some of those areas that, that have been excavated. And those would be for, for really important founding members of the, the royal dynasty. But yeah, they have been excavated. Uh, in fact, in 2016 now, um, uh, a Belizean archaeologist, Jaime Awe, uh, found what is considered one of the largest um, Maya tombs uh, associated with Shunan Tunich. So th there's research that continues to be done uh, today. Well, we can keep talking about that perhaps at the end of the session if we have any extra time. But right now, we want to take another take on the ancient and the thoroughly modern, sort of like Belize, certainly in the ancient and the contemporary living together. Professor Don Gale from philosophy and Professor Sheila Phillip, who is um, Emeritus Theater, they are going to discuss the fascinating nation of Japan. The old and the new are just interwoven in contemporary Japanese traditions and in thought. And so Don and Sheila are going to show us what we can learn from this ancient civilization, which has become an economic powerhouse. Thank you. Thank you. Am I, am I, can you hear me? Okay. Okay. I, um, I'm so glad to be here with Don today. And um, our hope was to do a trip to Japan what, two years ago and then last year, and now we're looking out to 23 probably before we can do it. Um, but Dawn and I both have um, quite a strong background in Japan. And um, first of all, Dawn, why don't you talk a little about what, um, what our, our, our trip plan was to be or is to be in the future? Sure, thanks, Sheila. Um, so we were looking at um, about a 12-day um, trip, um, and I think that um, gave us 10 to 12 days in Japan. Um, so we, our schedule, we're planning on going between um, the end of finals in the spring semester and the beginning of the summer term. So that way, students that are um, wanting to do summer classes would be able to get this trip in uh, between the end of the spring semester and then still be back for the beginning of summer classes. So that's our goal. And we would be 
beginning our trip in um, Tokyo and we would um, do a walking tour of the city um, and a welcome dinner of authentic Japanese cuisine. Um, I think one of the things that I like most about Japan is that the Japanese have turned just about everything into an art form that is really unmatched. And um, I, I think like many people, I consider myself a foodie. My husband's a chef. Um, we really enjoy the different food cultures of the world. Um, and then and Japan just takes it to a whole nother level, right? Because visually, the taste, the smells, just the presentation, everything they do is absolutely amazing. Um, in Tokyo, again, one of the main themes of our trip, as Jeanette mentioned, is looking at the, uh, the old and the new, the ancient um, philosophies and culture and the way that that impacts modern society and then the, the history and the centuries old temples next to extremely modern um, architectural uh, buildings like the Prada building is one that pops into my head in Tokyo or the Kyoto station we'll have some pictures of. Um, and so uh, we're gonna really explore culture both traditional and contemporary. One of the highlights in Tokyo, we're not making promises but we're trying to get tickets to the Studio Ghibli Museum. Um, it's a very difficult ticket to get and, but we have that as a, um, as a big um, hope in our itinerary. Um, from Tokyo, we plan to travel to Kyoto and get to explore um, a bit of the city, um, including the um, uh, famous entertainment district where we see the geisha. We um, plan to uh, experience a traditional Japanese tea ceremony and take a little half day trip to visit um, Uji which is the second largest tea growing region in Japan. Um, and uh, we can see some of the tea plantations and a little bit smaller um, town. Um, in Kyoto, we plan to um, visit uh, various temples and um, in the surrounding areas as well. So in Uji, um, Biodo Inn is a temple that is a world heritage site that we would plan to visit. In Kakuji is um, another temple I believe, uh, Sheila, did we have uh, Ryoenji and the Zen Garden? On yeah, we, we have we have a couple of gardens because I'm a great garden fanatic myself. <laughs> yeah, um, and they're just really unmatched. And then from Kyoto, our plan is to go to um, Hiroshima, which is one of the most impactful experiences that I have had. Um, you know, Absolutely. just the extreme honor of actually being able to do to visit Hiroshima more than once already, and hear. Um, uh, so, uh, survivor testimony of the atomic blast. So the Habaksha are survivors of the atomic blast and um, it's an experience that it's, it's absolutely a life-changing experience. And, um, you know, these are people that are, the, the people that are, are, are still surviving were very young um, during the, the time of the atomic bombing um, and we're losing survivors. Historically, we're losing survivors of the Second World War of both the Holocaust and the atomic bombs. And to have that opportunity um, to hear a survivor speak um, while they're still with us is something that is really an, an unmatchable um, experience. Um, so we plan to visit Hiroshima, spend some time in the International Peace Park and the Peace Memorial Museum. Um, we also plan to do a little day trip to Miyajima Island, and then we'll return back to Tokyo to have a little bit more time um, there before we return back to Kansas City. So uh, like Bill suggested, it's not a long trip, um, but we think that we've packed it full of things um, and that will really give you an experience of a lot of, of different elements of Japan and Japanese culture. Great, thank you. I'm gonna try to share my screen. We put together a little um, a little kind of uh, PowerPoint thing. Let me see if I can do this here. Um, I'm not doing a very good job here. Nice background, Sheila. I do oh, like thank that. You. <laughs> thank you. I'm Sheila, having- I can try to do it if you can. Yeah, why don't you try to do it if you would, John? That would be great. Um, go back. There you go. Great, I'm at the end. There we and go. Let me see. My menu is covered up, but I'll see if I can get into slideshow mode. Yep. There, I think right here. 
the Zoom menu wants to cover it, so I can't see okay. what I'm doing. Okay, well, um, so you can move the Zoom menu, Don. Just click and drag. Uh, okay. Because I've had that problem too. Don, I think if you go uh, straight up, you, see, you got it. <laughs> yeah, well, well yes. sorry about this. Let me let me visit we while go. we while we talk. And um, one of the things that I remember from my first trip to Japan was arriving in Tokyo and saying to myself, where is Japan? Because in my mind, it was, um, it was all traditional Japan. And so one of the things that I would, not to put words in Don's mouth, but I think both of us learned is that Japan has done this wonderful job of choosing not either or, but always both. So as she mentioned, you will see ancient next to modern. You will see um, Eastern versus Western side by side. So here's an example I put together of a very traditional architecture. <laughs> On the left, you see Kinkakuji, which is a Buddhist temple, a monastery. It was once upon a time a monastery. And on the right, is and now, now I've lost the name of the building, but one of the, the more made up sky building, I think, yeah. right? And it's yeah, it is. And so it's that you, you you compare these two and think, how can that be? But really, if you consider the fact that we in the United States, who think of ourselves as this great melting pot, we do some of the same things. We keep Liberty Hall and the Liberty Bell and things, but at the same time, we have really contemporary architecture as well. You want to go to, so here are some slides, I, some pictures I put together of what we think of as really traditional Japan. And when we talk about traditional Japan, mostly what we're thinking of is what, what's known as classical or Heian Japanese. But you see some tea utensils at the upper left, a very beautiful bonsai uh, on the right, and of course, the spring cherry blossoms. Uh, lower left. And then the next picture, the next slide is some very modern aspects of Japan. Um, uh, obviously, anime and manga are very popular and have become quite popular in the United States. Uh, Hatsune Miku, my friend on the right. And the picture above is one that I took. Um, we were walking in Roppongi, we stayed at the International House in Tokyo and we were walking in Rapungi, a group of us, and we just stopped to sort of talk and think about where we wanted to go. And I looked up and this kind of bar relief sculpture was right above me. It was pretty, a pretty fantastic moment. And I thought, okay, well, there's Japan. <laughs> I liked these two because the, the photograph on the left is of, um, a, a geisha in training or meiko and she's quite beautiful um, it's so interesting to me geisha means person of art and there's a lot of training that goes into being a geisha so meiko is a, a geisha in training and they get to wear much prettier colors many more hair ornaments and so forth but the photo on the right i thought well is this a modern day meiko here there are similar colors there's a lot of uh, decoration involved for both of them, uh, but Kawai, the girl in, on the right, is wearing Kawai, very cute outfit. Dawn, I'm going to let you talk a little about Kyoto Station because I know how much you love it. I do. I love it. I, I mean, I've spent hours upon hours, probably days, when you total it up. Um, uh, I think that Sheila, you had this experience as well on your first trip to Japan. Um, Sheila and I both participated in a program for college faculty um, on different teams many years apart, but we had the opportunity to meet the architect of the Umeda Sky Building that you saw in a previous slide, and then the Kyoto Station. And the Kyoto Station, this is the train station, is um, it was actually a very controversial uh, build because it is such a modern structure. And Kyoto is a very traditional town. So the um, Kinkakuji, the golden palace, the temple that you saw, Right, is, um, is located in Kyoto. And I don't know, I, I think how many temples, but I, I feel like it's in the hundreds in Kyoto mm -hmm. of, of temples. And it's a very, very traditional town in a lot of ways. It's not the big modern city of Tokyo, but yet you have this, these very modern structured, it structures intermingled. But there was a lot of controversy 
um, over this station. And it's, it's many different levels and layers, and there's a lot of different things to see. It's more than just a train station. Um, there are shops, there are restaurants. It's a destination in and of itself, and you can just spend so much time um, exploring, but such a, a, a modern structure, and there's art throughout, um, and you'll see both traditional art performances here and, and things, but also the very modern, as you see in some of these images, um, and it's just a great place to get a feel for um, traditional cultural. Again, you'll see people in kimono and, and geta and the, the sandals, and um, you'll see geisha, and you'll see the Japanese, the businessmen in their suits, and you'll see the kawaii culture um, of the, the young adults, and you'll see the school children and families. Um, it's just really a great place to get to watch and, and get a feel for all the different um, ways that Japanese culture blends its tradition with the contemporary life. And I don't know how well you can see it in the photograph on the left, but it's taken from one of the top levels. And to the left of that, there's an escalator going down, but you can also see people sitting and standing on different levels. And way down deep, it looks like there are a couple of, they almost look like old style film reels that are set horizontally. When you walk into the station, you walk under those. So it's really quite um, massive in size and scope. And Don, yeah. I'm, I'm going to let you speak here too. I, this is one of the, um, you said it's one of the most impactful things that you did. When people asked me what were my impressions of Japan, and I said the best day was being um, at Tofukuji Monastery and talking with the abbot a half day. And the most difficult day was the half day in Hiroshima at the International Peace Park and the A-bomb dome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think in different ways, those are two of the most impactful. And you know, for me, the day that we spent in, in Tofukuji and visiting with the head abbot, and we were able to, we had access to things that the public would, didn't have because of the leaders of our trip. and and getting to go into um, the, the, the Buddhist monastery and, and have lunch with the abbot um, was amazing. But I think um, just seeing you know, the, the complexities of history and, and having the knowledge, um, we tend to think of ourselves right, as the good guys. We were the allies, right? Um, we, we credit um, the, you know, our government and President Truman with ending the war. Right, but that that didn't come without cost and without responsibility. And the idea of I I, I do philosophy and I do ethics, right? And and so uh, good and evil as as dichotomist and existing in different places, right? Um, this just brings you a, a reality that um, this is one of the few buildings that was standing after the dropping of the atomic bomb. And I say standing in a rather loose sense because. Right, of course, it, it's not fully standing. This is the remnants of, of, of a building in Hiroshima. But um, when you visit the museum, and they've changed the museum and the exhibits at times, but I remember the first visit that I took, the first part of the museum, you had a model of the city that showed um, you know, the buildings and, and what it looked like before the mm -hmm. bomb. And then it was completely decimated. Right Afterwards, you just saw destroyed grounds essentially. And, and this was one of the few structures um, that you still saw, but, but to, to have that, the firsthand, the visuals and the experience, but more than anything else, um, you know, to meet the people and to talk to the people and to see the ongoing quest for and um, pursuit of, of peace and work that they do. Um, and to see the embodiment of, of Japanese values as, as well. Right? And understanding that um, you know, loss is uh, part of life, but things are, continue to can carry on and, and um, move forward. Right? And, and to see the way that that's embodied in Japanese society um, is an interesting. Uh, one, of, one of our colleagues asked me um, after a trip that I had to Hiroshima, my second trip in 2015, and, and just asked, well, you know, that, that they were interested in Japan, but they had this idea that the Japanese would just hate us, right? Hate Americans right. because of, of what we did. But if you look at the way the Japanese embrace American culture, popular culture, and, and 
you know, incorporated um, various right, Western traditions and values into contemporary um, Japanese. But I think that, you know, there you hear people talk about this and, and they realize that carrying a hatred in their hearts for the atrocities that were perpetrated during the times of war, that's not going to do anything for anyone, right? Moving forward, we live in a world where we're increasingly connected and we have to find ways to live together. And I think this is very important, right? The question, why study Japan? Jeanette mes uh, mentioned that we're an economic, they're an economic powerhouse, right? Um, have, since the mid 20th century. But I think another reason is that um, contemporary American history is tied up with Japan um, in terms of World War II, but beyond that, uh, because Japan uh, invoked a peace constitution and a peace treaty. And so we have, have in terms of right, um, the de demilitarization of Japan after World War II, we have a commitment um, to the Japanese, right, were they to be attacked, right, that we bear some of that responsibility for their defense. And that's another reason. Um, and certainly there's other really interesting reasons, especially in terms of um, current demographics. And so even though the global population has been increasing, right, we see differences in Japan than we do in other places. And we look at the, the world and that Japan has an aging society, right? And there's a lot of different questions about caregiving and providing, um, you know, in, in terms of um, the things that the Japanese society is experiencing now that might give us ways to think about how we move forward um, under different conditions. And so there's a lot of different reasons, but I think that this is a big one for studying yeah. in Japan. I would agree. Would you advance? Mm -hmm. So I put these two images together because I thought, I wonder what the samurai on the left might think <laughs> of the youth on the right. Um, it's, 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 there are so many images I could have shared. There's, there is one that I use when I taught the introduction to Japanese culture course, there was one that I used that was of a model who was made up and it was very contemporary makeup, but it was very reminiscent of Kabuki makeup. They mix old and new all the time. And I just really I kind of enjoyed the juxtaposition of these two images together. And this is, I think I took this at Uji, perhaps, the tea growing region. These are tea bushes and they're grown on terraces like this. You can see um, visitors and workers in among those. It's such an interesting kind of textural image to me. I, I wish I could run my hand down, down that slope. But one of the things that Dawn and I plan for um, our, our study abroad program is, a trip to Uji that would include um, some tea tasting because there's white tea and there's green tea, there's sencha, there's matcha, and you learn how they how they cure it, how when they pick it, how they cure it. Uh, you get to have a taste test, with all of which I think is a, pr a pretty interesting process. I, I had to include a garden image just because I love gardens. Um, when I taught the Japanese culture course, one of the things I asked students on the first day is, what brought you to this class? What brought you to Japan? And most of them tell me it's anime and manga. But some say, oh, it was sushi, or oh, it was gardens. And so for me, I'm, a, a, as I said earlier, a great fan of Japanese gardens, and I just wanted to include a photo to entice you a little bit. And this last slide is a picture of paper cranes. I took this, a close up at the base of one of the mon many monuments that is in the International Peace Park at Hiroshima. Some of you may know from your childhood, the story of uh, a thousand cranes that Sadako was a, a girl and she, after the atomic bomb blast, she came down with leukemia and was in the hospital and there is a Japanese belief that if you fold a thousand paper cranes, your wish will come true. And her wish did not come true. She did pass away from leukemia, but school children from all over the world fold paper cranes and string them and send them and they are just festooned all over the base of the children's monument at Hiroshima. 
And it's so colorful, but so poignant as well. Thank you. Well, thanks so much. I think um, certainly the trip to Hiroshima must be very, very, very sobering. Um, Sheila, there used to be a small Japanese garden on campus by the gymnasium. Is it maintained at all? Do you know? Uh, we didn't. We didn't do anything last spring because of um, COVID. And when I was teaching the Japanese culture course, we I would hire um, actually. Um, facilities on campus would hire um, Koji Morimoto, who is a Japanese gardener here in town, to come and um, and with my students from the Japanese culture class, we would maintain the garden. And so I know that I shared that information with Sarah Aptalan, who's who I think she and Don are both teaching Japanese culture now, but it's something that I hope we can continue to do. So right in front of the gym, You'll see several stones there. It is a kind of garden called karasansui, which means a dry garden. So you'll see some pebbles that um, suggest a river. You'll see a bridge rock you can walk across. There are some stones that you can sit upon. You're, you know, we don't want you to sort of walking through the plants, but you can, or the or the pebble river, but you can walk on stepping stones and sit there and read a book or a sketch or any anything like that. So yeah, it's still there. I haven't been over to see what it looks like for a while. All right, so we can all take a little short field trip to the gym. Also, there's a Japanese garden in Loose Park, yes. um, which I don't know if they maintained it this past year. No, they did. I so that's- so. I think the Japan, uh, the Heart of America, Japan America Society has yeah, continued to maintain so. that. And there's, a, and there's a small tea room that, that looks out onto that garden as well. And for students, we do teach a Japanese history and also Japanese culture, two separate courses. So I think they're opposite each other. Once one semester, once the other. But as you're planning, actually, Japanese culture, we've been getting so much enrollment. But it, I think is offered both in the fall and the spring right now. All right. So you have opportunities, students, to take that either semester. So and we have a new faculty member who um, has some expertise in Japanese history since Ben Clark, our faculty member who was teaching that class, retired. Um, and he spent several years living and teaching in Japan. I had the pleasure of meeting Eric um, Glowark a couple weeks ago, and he's going to be doing Japanese history, I think, moving forward. Very good. So just a final question, unless somebody has one for the chat, I just want to clarify, Sheila, your kind of your favorite moment in Japan was that former monastery. Well, Kinkakuji, the, the, it's called the Golden Pavilion, and it's really the only temple in Japan that is colorful or in that case, golden. Most of it is, is rather plainer wood, um, not painted as you might see in China, for example. Um, but it's such a beautiful site, and I, did, I, can't, I could not find my picture of it, but you can walk all around the lake that it sits on, and there, I have a picture from the back of it of a, a small boat in a, in a boathouse next to the Golden mm -hmm. Pavilion with pine needles with raindrops on them, and it's, <laughs> so yeah, it was, it's a very beautiful place. That, and I think um, being at Tofukuji. Tofukuji is a monastery that's on two hills that are divided by a valley. And there are three bridges that cross the valley to go to the other part of the monastery. And the abbot told us that, you know, part of the notion of Buddhism is to, is to, that, that yearning causes suffering, that desiring things too much causes our suffering. And he says, but I, I do yearn sometimes. I yearn for things. And we asked, well, what? He said, I yearn for bridges. Bridges are the symbol of Tofukuji. And so when I travel, I say, someone take me to see the Brooklyn Bridge. He said, because bridges connect us. Mm, that is very lovely. And Don, your kind of most impactful moment was the atomic uh, memorial, atomic bomb memorial. I, I think that's among them. And I think also um, I had the opportunity to spend a few days at Koyasan, um, which is a temple town at the top of a mountain, uh, Mount Koya, and um, visit a, it was a seventh century temple town um, and visit a cemetery where they say that 
um, that Kukai, who's responsible for bringing Buddhism um, uh, to Japan, is buried. And I think that's one of the most spiritual places um, that I've ever been. And I found, I, I felt a, a very deep sense of peace. And I think in general, when I, when I travel to the, Japan, there's just something that feels very comfortable and maybe more spiritual, which I don't often consider myself a very spiritual person, but there's just this, this, this kind of sense of calming and spirituality um, that I've not experienced many other places. Um, maybe one place in, in Israel, uh, which I talked about last year in our global speaker series. Uh, but it's, uh, yeah. So I think those are probably, um, you know, my, my most impactful memories. And Bill, you did your graduate research in Belize, you said, or your, at least your initial research. Is that sort of what's impactful for you? Well, it, I, I never did my graduate research there. I was an undergraduate when I worked okay. at Caracol. And so for me, going back to Caracol after 20 some odd years um, to see how much has changed and how much hasn't was, was pretty eye opening. Yeah. And that was sort of the beginning for you of what has followed in terms of archaeology and. Yeah, that that was the start of a, a, a big chapter of my life of working in um, Central America doing archaeology. Yeah, absolutely. So students are all of us because we can all be students and travel with JCCC. All you have to do is register in the one credit hour course. Um, one of the things I love about being associated with a community college is that, you know, you can study here for the rest of your life. And I have been a JCCC student at various times. So be saving some money. Make sure you have a valid passport. We are, I hope, going to be studying abroad next year. These courses will be offered and uh, we would love to include you on some of them. So the series, thank you again to all three of our speakers for your time, for your presentations. Um, you will receive links to the YouTube video for the recording, and the series will come back in two weeks on Wednesday, October 27, when we will virtually travel to Costa Rica and to Martinique, which are two lovely tropical destinations. Before then, next week on Thursday, our colleagues in the International and Immigrant Student Services Office We'll sponsor a great decisions discussion via Zoom on Thursday at two o'clock. So if you want to discuss some of the great decisions that our world faces, that will be your opportunity. Thanks so much. Until next time, stay healthy, stay safe, and do what you can to explore the world.